Very good. All right. Oh, this is going to go wrong. So I'm going to give an answer to this question. How do microbes adapt to different environments? And the answer that I'm going to give is somewhere in between a fantasy, a proposal, and a theory. So this should give uh, rise to lots of discussion. I would be happy to, to hear your opinion. Um, so we'll first introducing the question, um, microbes can adapt to, to many different environments, of course. We all know this. And often the environment is not known. Uh, in the future, in the wild, many things can happen. You can have nutrient changes, um, antibiotics, salinity, temperature. Um, and somehow these microbes can still adapt. And uh, for example, if we look at our favorite E. coli, we can grow it in the, in the modern regime as they do in our lab. They can grow in the gut and they can grow in wastewater plants. It's quite a, a diverse spectrum already. But what's even uh, more striking is that if you give them something that they've clearly never seen before, even to that they can adapt. So this is a study where they um, took the growth medium and took all the um, hydrogen atoms from the water and replaced it by deuterium. And E. coli just completely reshapes its proteome. All the, well, the whole, all, everything changes and still, they can then um, grow again. So, well, one theory that people would like to give, um, it's a bit extreme how I present it, um, is that, well, microbes have just learned by evolution to set the right phenotype in all these environments. So, sensors have evolved such that they can know in what environment they are, and then they have regulators that know what, what phenotype fits this environment, and that is how it goes. But this is clearly wrong. So how can you have learned what you never saw, as in the case with the deuterium? Um, so evolution cannot have shaped you to address that. At the same time, how can you be precise? Well, we know that gene expression is very noisy. So even if you know what you have to do, and you want to do that, Gene expression is so noisy that you might just do a very bad approximation of that. And then last, there's, because given the small molecule numbers in cells of transporters and sensors, we know that there's just fundamental physical limits to how much information you can gather about your environment. So it's impossible to know exactly the glucose concentration in your environment. So I propose a different hypothesis, or well, I've open hypothesis. I just say microbes must use some trick that makes this um, phenotype search easier. And my talk is about um, giving you a trick that I think is convincing. So this frame hopefully will be filled at the end of the talk. So let's um, take a very simple model system. We just have three phenotypes and in uh, a purple, a red, and a green one, and then in the purple environment, as indicated by uh, the background of the square, uh, only the purple one grows. Then over time, of course, the environment can change and we go to a red environment, now only the red phenotype can change. It's still quite easy. But now we have to come up with some model how the, um, the cell is going to adapt and find the right phenotype. And when I started thinking about this in my PhD, I was heavily influenced by this paper um, by Erik van Inwege, which is why I'm now in his lab doing my postdoc. Um, it's important, uh, well, it shows that expression noise, which I just propose as a nuisance to gene expression, can really help in adaptation. And this is also apparent in a famous paper by Kussel and Leipler, where they show that bat hedging can, can um, help a population adapt. So I'm going to go uh, extend this, this uh, last paper a bit. So let's first recap what they do. So I extend this model where I have these three phenotypes with random switching rates between these phenotypes. So these are indicated by the um, arrows in between the, the circles. Um, cells can just um, randomly sometimes switch from phenotype to phenotype. And what does this do to your adaptation? Ah, sorry. One point, what I'm going to show you is that 
even though the single cells do not have a bias versus going to the right phenotype, because they're switching all the phenotype to all the phenotypes in the same at the same rate, they will still adapt on the population level. Well, how come? Because if you start in an environment, each environment, uh, each cell will randomly search through the space of phenotypes. And um, so starting in the purple um, environment with all, all cells and the green phenotype, they will just randomly switch sometimes and they will, might happen to be in the purple phenotype, which will then start growing and will outgrow the rest. So we just have some phenotypic selection here. If you go to the red phenotype, you see that the red phenotype, uh, red environment, the red phenotype takes over. So Kasson Leibler made a nice model and it was already quite simple, but not simple enough for what I'm going to do after. So I'm, I'm making my simplest model of this system. So I have one growing phenotype, the purple one, and there's n non-adapted phenotypes. And I say there's only two growth rates, a fast growth rate and a slow growth rate. And because I can scale and shift, uh, these growth rates are going to be one and zero, but that doesn't matter. Then I choose a fixed environment duration because I just want one parameter that says how frequently I shift. And this environment duration I call T. Between the phenotypes, there's then a uh, constant switching rate, phi. Okay, so this gives rise to some ordinary differential equations um, where I can kind of group all the non-adapted phenotypes into one group because they have the same dynamics anyhow. Uh, and so this are the SB, so it's bad, B is for bad, and uh, the SG, so the good phenotypes. Um, you see, well, it makes sense, right? So um, they are growing with a rate of one minus the rate at which they're switching to other phenotypes a phi, but there's also um, cells that were non-adapted that, that switch to the adapted um, phenotype, but only one in n times this is the right switch, right? Because there's many options to do it, to do a wrong switch. So this is the growth in the environment. Then if we go to a new environment, <coughs> um, there's a certain, before you switch, there's a certain fraction of cells that are adapted, and this is this P, or P at the time point uh, T, which is the time point of switching. Now I'm going to assume that the cells are equally distributed over the non-adapted phenotype because this equilibrated. It comes down to some mild assumptions on the length of the environment. Then I can say that the new starting fraction in the new environment is one over N times the number of non or the fraction of non adapted cells in the previous environments. Because all these cells that were non-adapted have a chance to be adapted to the next environment. Okay, so I can solve this model and I can then look at the long-term growth rate. And with the long-term growth rate, I mean um, just the average exponential growth rate if I take the, the cells, number of cells at the end point divided by the number of cells at the beginning point. Now, I just want to make clear that this is not a phenotype. So there were some discussions that I think are sometimes a bit confusing uh, because we don't use the same wording. So when I talk about this long-term growth rate, this is the long, the average growth rate. And there's no discussion about if you're selection for this because it's the, this is the definition of being selected. It's saying how many were there of, how many does my number increase? I agree that the growth rate in a certain environment or the maximal growth rate, this is a phenotype, but this thing, what I'm going to maximize, this is just evolutionarily selected. Having that out of the way, I can now just use G. Um, and I find that if I optimize the optimal switching, the switching rate, and um, of course I don't know that this thing is optimized. And um, I can show you plots later where we don't do this and we get, well, similar results. So I can show it at the end if you want. But <clears throat> if we optimize this, it's already interesting what comes out because the optimal switching rate turns out to be one over T, one over the environment duration. 
And um, Cosmon Live already found this, so this is not mine. So I can say that this is a very nice result. I'm not bragging. Um, but the, um, this has a deep relation with uh, optimal portfolio theory or, or betting on horse races. You want to um, bet on the strategy proportion, in proportion to the probability that this um, strategy is going to be successful. And this 1 over t um, is the probability that you're going to switch environments. So that's why this comes out. And then the um, long-term growth rate is also a beautiful um, formula. It has just the maximal growth rate you could possibly have, one as an upper limit, and then two cost terms. So you have a diversity cost, which is the cost of switching to different phenotypes. Uh, yeah, one moment. And then you have a delay cost, which is after every environment, um, you need some time to expand the pre-adapted subpopulation to take over the population. Yes. Yeah, no, just a curiosity. I mean, uh, it looks like it's not a dimensional what you have in the log. So there should be another time constant. Ah. Um. Uh, so that, that I would have to look up. There are some rescalings that we did. Um, because phi, ah, phi is divided by the growth rate. So I think that's why it's uh, und become undimensional. Because we rescaled it by the maximal growth rate. But yeah, we, we, it's a good point. Uh, but uh, I might come back to it. Yeah. Um, so if we see what the results are for if I well, my model is really simple, right? I have to only two parameters. I have an n, which is the number of non-adapted phenotypes, which kind of captures the, how hard my search problem is in phenotype space. And I have a t, which is um, how long my environment takes. And now you see that you can go even without any regulation, without any bias between which phenotype you switch to uh, and not. Um, you see that you <coughs> can get to reasonable, reasonably high growth rates uh, average growth rate, if you have either a small number of phenotypes, so it's a relatively simple problem, or you have a long environment duration. So this is indeed what uh, Kassel and Leitler found. Bad hedging is effect, can be effective, but only if environments are not too diverse and environments change relatively infrequently. Now, this was showing that bet hedging could work, but it would also put bet hedging for a, a, a very long time in a sort of corner where it could only solve relatively easy problems. So antibiotic persistence, this is generally accepted to be a, that you can solve this um, with just switching sometimes to a persister phenotype uh, <coughs> and because it's only two states, right? You are either a persist or not. But in the wild, just changing, uh, adapting to all kinds of uh, different environments, different nutrients, different everything. Um, and this can happen very frequently. It was not thought about that bat hedging could do this. Um, but I'm going to give some experimental observations that make me think that it is actually possible to do random adaptation to a quite a good level. So this is work done by uh, Thomas Julou and Theo Gervais, who is uh, also here in the, in the room, uh, on the LAC operon. And it shows that regulatory switches become more sensitive at low growth rate. So let me first quickly introduce the LAC operon. So it's, it's um, needed to uptake, do the uptake of lactose. Um, and it has an inhibitor, LAC-I, um, so to touch that, if it is, uh, this is repressing the operon, and if there's then lactose outside the cell, or in this case, inducer, because this is artificial inducer, because they did the experiments with that, um, it cannot take it up. But sometimes there is a bit of leaky expression of the transporter. This will make sure that the um, inducer is um, imported, the inhibitor is inhibited, and you will kickstart the system, and luck will um, be fully turned on. So you can look at this switch in different conditions and ask how much artificial inducer do I need to kickstart this operon? Now, you can see that the 
the critical concentration of inducer that you need really shifts between conditions. And what is even stronger is when you plot this against growth rate, you really get a Terry like plot, I would say. It's a beautiful straight line. Um, and what you see is that um, cells become more sensitive um, to fluctuations, these small or, or, or outside concentrations, um, at low growth rates. So this is something I will take in the next um, part of the story. Another thing is that we also saw that growth rates lowers the gene expression noise. So this is looking at um, high copy number proteins and then at the noise floor. They will not go to zero in their noise. Um, but it will, there also the, the noise floor will decrease with increasing growth rate. So together with that the gene regulatory systems be, can become more sensitive at low growth rate, uh, yes, low, low growth rate, also, the fluctuations in gene expression will increase, which just paints a picture that um, cells become more likely to switch between phenotypes. Now, how do I put this in my model? I had this bet hedging model, and now I can, um, I can say I can just change one thing. Whenever you're not growing, you're going to switch a bit more, right? Which seems reasonable given that experimental observations that we have. But I will tell you that this is in fact the trick that makes life a lot easier for the microbes. So how does this work? Well, we have this system and we saw that bed hedging alone could make a population adapt. But now the picture drastically changes. If we introduce this growth rate dependent stability as we call it, the adaptation of the population to a new environment is much faster, and it also goes to a higher uh, final growth rate. Well, how does this work? <coughs> well, if we look at the, at the moment, at the point where we start a new environment, almost all the cells are in the purple um, phenotype. But when we switch to the red environment, these purple cells, they will all start, stop growing, and this will increase their phenotype switching rate. So these slow cells will kind of panic and just move around searching for a growth rate. And they will only stabilize uh, once they find this fast growth phenotype. And on top of that, so this biases already the population towards phenotypes where you grow fast. On top of that, they will still outgrow the other cells in different phenotypes. So you have a double um, advantage of being in this fast growth phenotype. So I can, of course, also calculate the, the consequences in my model. Yes. Yes. Um, could you explain the reason for, like, there is a slight dip in the brown phenotype, even though there is a, oh, no. Uh, I'm ah. not sure. I'm not able to understand the graph properly, I yeah. think. All right. These are, these are relative frequencies, and they add up to, to one. Um, so there's no dip in the red phenotype, um, but there's just an increase in the green phenotype as well. Because the purple um, phenotype starts switching away, and it will switch uh, randomly to both red and uh, green. So that's why you, you see the green increase, and it seems like there's a dip in the reds as well but I don't think there is. Um, yes, so I change one parameter in my model to capture this effect. So only a multiplicative factor R that multiplies the switching rates um, from cells that are non-adapted. What are the consequences of that? Well, I pick a completely arbitrary R of 100. I don't know if this is reasonable. That's why I made it the parameter. Everyone can pick whatever they find reasonable. I just want to know, does it work for all these parameters? And what you see is that the growth rates for all parameters, uh, N and T, increase, and quite drastically. I can, because I have such a small model, I can look at all the parameter combinations, and um, you should um, read this 
that on the y-axis, or on the x-axis, there's the uh, strength of this growth rate dependent stability. So along the y-axis, we see the normal bed hedging. There's no, there's just a growth rate dependent stability that is well, one, so everything is the same. And if you then go to the right, and on the y-axis, we, we change the parameters, the, the number of bad phenotypes, uh, and the environment duration. And if you go to the right, you see that you always get an increase in the fitness. Well, there are some more things that we can see in this plot. For example, what are these diagonal lines meaning? Well, we can talk about this later. I don't have time. Um, looking at, well, we, we try to, of course, do the analytical derivation. And it's quite elegant. We just get the same expression as Castle and Leiper got, including an extra term that gives me the strength of the growth rate dependent stability effect. And this effect can make this statement that we found from the Castle and Leiper paper change from bad hedging is only effective in such and such case to it can even be effective if environments are diverse and environments change frequently. And it just depends on how strong your growth rate dependent stability is. So I think this is a really strong effect. So just quickly summarizing before I go to my last two slides, um, we found that bed hedging can make a microbial population adapt, but only in very simple scenarios that were not really, really describing the nature in my uh, view. Um, but then adding the observations that cells become more sensitive and to fluctuations and get more fluctuations at low growth rates, um, this brings you to growth rate dependent stability, and we saw that this can really make uh, populations much more effective in adapting. But there's, of course, a problem, because it we should also at some point get out of our theoretical bubble and look a bit more, are our predictions correct? Because if I th say that all the switching or all the adaptation can be done by just random switching, then, well, why do microbes even have sensors? And we started thinking about this to say, well, we want one theory that, that incorporates both sensing and this randomness. I will make an attempt here, and this is where, where the fantasy part comes in a bit. Right? But um, so I would be happy to discuss this. If you have, well, here a metabolic network, but of course, well, I'm, I'm meaning all the genes. Um, in principle, all the phenotypes are all the levels of genes that you can express. If you fluctuate randomly in this space, you can have a very efficient search strategy, but you're never going to find anything. It's just too big a space. So we need sensing and regulation. For example, we know that for the lac operon that it doesn't turn on if there's no lactose. Right? So these genes are shut down and they just don't, you don't have fluctuations in that direction. So what if we know in this network that these substrates are not around? Then sensing can limit the space that we have to search by just removing some reactions. There it can limit the fluctuations there. Then on top of that, there's a result, also from the lab of Eric van Inwegen, that um, gene expression noise is not um, random in all directions. It actually is, uh, propagates through the gene regulatory network. What do I mean with that? That if there's a transcription factor that targets a set of genes that are often related, if the, there's noise in the transcription factors, it will propagate through all the genes. So I'm not just randomly fluctuating in all directions in the phenotype space, but I'm having directed fluctuations, which really limits the space I have to search because these, evolution has determined that these often correlate, so I want to have fluctuations in that direction. Now, if I have another transcription factor for a different set of uh, reactions, I can see that this will really help. Right? I'm limiting the effective dimensionality of the phenotype space I'm searching. Together with the phenotype, with the random switching rates and the adaptation that that causes, I think this can go a very long way 
in explaining how microbes adapt to all these different environments. So um, I'm just adding these two last points to the summary. And um, I would like to thank Aage Chalma, who was my um, uh, master student. And then we asked for a grant together to work on this. It was a very nice year that we worked on this. Uh, Frank Bruggeman, who is there on the, on the bike. Um, and then the new group that I'm in uh, of Erik van Nimwegen um, and this yeah, band of noise busters, as we are called. Um, if you have time and you're interested, we can also discuss this uh, right picture um, after the talk because it's really, there's so much to see. Um, so I'll leave you with a summary and I'm happy to answer questions. Hi, uh, thank you. It's a, it was a wonderful talk. I have one comment and, and one question slash comment. So first comment, I see some uh, analogy between this and uh, the strategy in chemotaxis. Yeah, uh, where you also, the strategy is if you're doing well, you keep on doing what you're doing. If you're not doing so well, you randomly switch to other things. Yes. That was the comment. And the question slash comment is, um, do you think that uh, this strategy could be used for, um, for optimization algorithms, like a new type of evolutionary slash genetic algorithm, or improving existing algorithms? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so first, uh, first uh, we also thought about chemotaxis. Um, and Eric, uh, at some point, told me, I wouldn't touch chemotaxis with a 10-foot pole. Um, so, because this is the pet project of many physicists, and there's been done so much work, but I do agree with you that there's a uh, really uh, good analogy. Um, yes, so optimization, that's also true. Um, Ach and I also looked at this at some point. Um, there's a very nice Wikipedia uh, page of all the nature-inspired optimization algorithm. It's really impressive. There's bees, ants, um, everything in nature has been transferred into an optimization algorithm. I'm almost sure that if we st try this, there's already some other algorithm that does this. Yeah. Um, so I, mm, there's maybe something that I missed, or maybe what I'm about to say is totally trivial. But I think, uh, switch, I mean, there should be a relationship between how fast you switch away from a phenotype and the growth rate of that phenotype. I mean, uh, if you switch away ah. to, you see, these are two time scales, right? You must have. You must be able to sense one of the two time scales uh, before you decide to switch away. Uh, no, I don't understand it. Sorry. I mean, uh, uh, the switching rate uh -huh. uh, should be uh, slow enough for you to be able to ah, quantify yes. the growth rate where you are. Where you are. Yes. So I would expect that. I, I agree completely. For example, we, we, when we looked at this plot, there's some region that might not be so biological. So, oh. so if you go to very um, short environment durations here, you're, you can still get to uh, optimal fitness, which I thought is impossible. Right? But what happens is that you want your switching rate to go to infinity. Um, well, which is not, right? it works because you will have a very strong bias between if you have a large enough R, it's very strong by from switching to the fast phenotype versus away from it. Um, but uh, I mean, it's not, um, well, you have to sense your growth rate before you can switch. Um, but you could, of course, couple not only to growth rate itself, but also to um, flux in the glycolytic, um, uh, gly glycolytic flux, for example, as a nutrient um, transport. You induce a transporter when it doesn't um, start up, you can immediately switch away again, right? So, but, but I agree with you that there should be a cap on your switching rates uh, at some point. But this is why R is also a parameter, right? So you can say, well, this is not, no longer feasible. Yeah. Um, actually, a comment on the last yeah. bit. I think probably the cells can sense much faster that they're in a slow growth rate than, than we can see that. The, like, we take 
it takes much longer to see that the growth rate is low, but I guess they sense it much faster than us, right? Somehow. Because, yeah. yeah, anyway. Uh, so my question was about, the, so your, your model of the switching is very discrete, I guess. It's like a set of n states. And in experimentally, I think people at least believe that when you, like, they were starving for glucose, they, like, all the cells, like, express all the transporters. But I guess nobody really tested it in single cell level. So do you think actually what we see is like an ensemble of like different switchings that we think they're all doing the same thing? Yeah, so what I really believe is that um, you have some discrete part where you switch kind of to the right pathway. And then there's another optimization algorithm that within the pathway optimizes the, the relative concentrations. Uh, now, Bob will talk about this later, but that is very deterministic. What I did with Aachen, and this was the other branch of the project that didn't finish because my money was out and Aachen had to go do his PhD somewhere, um, which was actually saying, well, if you have a distribution on a continuous um, spectrum, then it is known that you're also pulled towards the optimum, even if your mean invariance or your mean of your distribution of phenotypes or concentrations that you aim for um, is different from the optimum. You're pulled towards the optimum because there's just a selection of the cells that have the right concentration and they give this to their uh, daughters. Um, and we wanted to see if this also increasing if you have some growth rate dependent um, fluctuations. Well, it's still an open question, I think. I also had a question about the switching rate. So if uh, cells get stuck in an intermediate uh, growing rate, like if the phenotype is not the best but slightly good, and uh, they become then stable, will they be stuck in there? That's, thank you. I have an extra slide. So in this model, I made many assumptions. Um, I have a fixed environment time. I have the number of environments equal to the number of phenotypes. I have one phenotype growing. The rest is, uh, is, is, is growth arrested. But of course, I can sample all these things. And what I did is I sample randomly growth rates. Um, I even, I, mean, I also said that the switching rates were optimized. Now, I did all these parameters and I sampled them as randomly as I could and I found that um, you always get an increase in your growth rate if you increase the strength of GRDS. So to address this more specifically, because I just wanted to put in this slide now, um, to uh, address this more specifically, you still have a monotonic relation between switching rate and growth rate. So if you get into an intermediate state, you're still more likely to switch to the adapted phenotype than the other way around. So you keep this bias, but of course it gets less and less strong the closer your growth rate is to the optimal one. But if you're already close to the optimal one, it's also not so necessary to adapt, right? So it's, it's kind of, it worked kind of nicely. Yeah, yeah I wanted to ask, um, like according to this uh, model, how would you say this would then apply to that deuterium Example you mentioned at the beginning, and how would like a bacterium evolve a sensor to deuterium if it would, or something like that? I think um, in the deuterium, the growth rate just drops a lot, and they're just going to try out lots of different stuff. And uh, in the end, uh, they, they are panicking so much that some cell finds something that works. Sorry? Yes, yes. Yeah, so sooner or later it finds a solution and it has to not die before that, right? So yeah, I mean, the, the, but if you consider like the space of possibilities is quite large, so basically the cells would be trying everything at random, that's like a lottery. Yes, huh? well that's what I was pointing at at the end, that there's of course some genes that, that are co-regulated and they fluctuate together such that you don't have to find to to search the whole gene expression space. So that's where sensing and regulation comes in. Um, I've also thought about, can we somehow find the dimensionality of the search space? But I really don't have a good idea of how to quantify this. 
But if they do sense it, then they cannot sense something which was unknown until then, no? No, that, that's not, but they can um, regulate up and down the same the genes that are often um, uh -huh. that are needed together, right? If you have the whole glycolysis pathway and you're independently changing the genes, then they cannot work. But if you up and down regulate them together, then they, they might so, work. So if you expose them frequently, they'll find a way to know that they, there's deuterium and they will then try to... No, I don't think so. I just space. Uh, don't think they are changing around things until until they find something that works on the theory. You don't no, have no, to do it. No, no, but I, I was asking then how would like a sensor evolve? Ah, ah, sorry, I misunderstood. Uh, I haven't looked into that question. That's a, that's a good question, but uh, uh, no, I, I, I don't know. Like what's your guess? <laughs> No, I don't have a guess. <laughs> it really depends, right? If for a nutrient, it's often a transporter that already does a lot, right? So, but deuterium, I don't even know. Uh, no. There's a question there and there. Right. Yes, but Jacobo is telling me to cut it. Ah. Yes, I think everybody with question has to uh, just hoard around Dan, and he'll have to answer to all of your questions over lunch. Okay, thank you. <laughs>